uh, the name below the title, John Doe. Uh, everybody, you know him, you love him. And the legendary Jack Wilson. Here we go. Hi, everybody. All right. Long Beach, rock and roll. Saturday afternoon. Children will try to keep it clean. <laughs> uh, so I'll just, we, we don't have a moderator today, so I'll just kind of give you the lowdown on, on how this stuff came together. Tom kept haranguing the shit out of me. So, oh, damn it. <laughs> the crap out of it. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I mean, God uh, damn it, John. From, from now on, it'll be totally clean. <laughs> Tom kept haranguing me along with my partner to write a book. Uh, this is uh, six or seven years ago. 20. And, well, that was the first time. That was the beginning of it. And so eventually I, I, I had one good idea, which was not to have to do it all myself. Uh, so we get different perspectives. I wouldn't have to be the authority. And as much as I loved all these different stories, I couldn't tell them. So that's how Under the Big Black Sun came to be. And then it did pretty well. So the publisher said, we have an option. How about the second book? Get to work, boys. And so uh, we actually hired my partner on as a creative consultant, and she said, the idea that you have for the, for the second book is depressing and horrible. Don't do it. <laughs> and I said, okay, <clears throat> smarty pants, what do we do? And we talked about it, and she came up with this idea of the legacy of this uh, 82 to 87 time period. So we got uh, people like Shepard Ferry and Allison Anders and, and uh, Tim Robbins and Tony Hawk to, to write some chapters too because they took the whole punk rock ethos and said, I can apply this to something else besides music. That's where we're at. And uh, <clears throat> we asked Jack to come along and we asked, uh, you know, Louis Perez from Los Lobos because we had a pretty, uh, from 82 to 87, there's pretty broad palette of um, musicians and styles of music. Tom? I was just going to say, we kept the depression in, and we kept the <laughs> sex and drugs and rock and roll in. Yes, there's plenty of sex and drugs and rock and roll. So, and well, we Jack uh, has joined us for both books. One, there's a, a handful of authors that were part of both books, so thank you, Jack, for coming along a second time. Indeed. So, um, Tom? Yes, John? <laughs> What was, the, what was one of the more surprising elements uh, in, in getting the chapters, this book? What, you, re, you read a chapter and you thought, huh. Well, uh, overall, much like the first book, the big surprise was that I the, don't want overall the screamers. Okay, oh, you don't want overall specific. I want a specific. specific. Charlotte Caffey is a freaking badass. <laughs> that Clearly. Across. Yes. Uh, her story of addiction and recovery and un unapologetic. Uh, I don't think anybody knew how deep into addiction she was, uh, how she handled it, how she wrote about it. It was just that, that was the chapter, I think, when I first read it uh, that kind of knocked me on my ass. So. And, and I, I'll add to that that she kept her center about so you know, what centered her was songwriting. So even though she was completely spun out and <laughs> something we can all identify with, I think, um, she still had one thing that she held on to, which is um, kind of inspiring. Um, Mr. Grisham, if yeah. I may call you Mr. Grisham. Yes, I'm, uh, just, I'm listening. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, it's, it's I'm like, a fan. See, that's well, it's, I'm stoked to be here, yeah. so it's nice. But it's anyway. like, the, the, the thing is like, oh, it's, it's good that you're here, and it's like good to be anywhere. That's right. The alternative sucks. Yes. Did, as, as you sort of flip through the, 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 um, the rest of these chapters, did you have a, a particular moment that you thought, holy crap, I didn't know that? Well, I knew a lot of it. I knew yeah. a lot from some of it. What I like the best is being able to sit and actually sit with them, because I'm a fan. Like, I'm a fan. So to sit with Charlotte and sit with Louis and sit with these people and Shepard and Tony Hawk, because I got to visit with them, that's what I like the best, to right. see the people behind the work, really. Because you see the work, 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 but to meet the people is what I love. To like. Yeah. Jack, Jack took some, uh, <clears throat> some pretty great portraits of uh, 
of all of us as we were doing the audio book. There's an audio book, not just this yes. old fashioned thing. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you know anybody who's uh, a Grammy member uh, <laughs> and a voting Graham, can you say the V word? I don't think you can. Sure. Uh, Please uh, ask them to consider us. It's, they have very strict rules, these uh, Grammyites. Tell, tell, tell about the book, John. What, what, what is the audiobook? The audiobook is all these authors, many, many names, some all bold faced names, uh, reading their own chapters. And Jack took these fabulous portraits of them as they filed in one after the other to read their chapters. So. You know, probably 20 years in the future when we're all croaking uh, and, and gone from this uh, earthly uh, delight, there will be a, a document, you know, sort of a historical thing, which is, which is cool. Um, do you have any questions, Tom? Uh, no, no. I think we don't have a moderator, you're not. Well, I have to been, carry all the you're doing water good. if you don't You mind. guys want to hear John read a chapter? Do you want to hear about that? Let's have a reading from the book of John, shall we? <laughs> Or would you like to go first, Mr. Gershon? Well, I'm, whatever you guys want me to do, I'm, I'm just, I'm here. All right. Okay. <clears throat> um, as, this, uh, as this was kind of coming to a close, uh, Chip Kinman's brother, uh, Tony, passed away, Tony Kinman. And actually that was a, a bittersweet moment because uh, Tony was able to kind of write Chip's chapter with him. And, and Chip would come in and say, he's told this story a few times, uh, which is why I know it. He would come in to, to Tony and say, so I'm going to talk about this and this and this. And, and then and Tony would go, that's not the way it happened. <laughs> and so he felt um, pretty tied together. But it's been on, I think, everyone's mind, especially with social media and stuff like that. As soon as someone croaks, you, you're, everybody knows about it. And it's like, you know, it, it's... Uh, Makes it a little more difficult, maybe. I don't, I'm not sure. So anyway, uh, this is sort of related to that. Fallen soldiers. We didn't even know that we, we were in an army or in some kind of war. It had been a war of attrition, where the punk rockers or those associated with punk had not fared well. We all had different reasons for being in the trenches, but all did it with fire and blood. For it's a life that can beat you down, drink by drink, tour by tour, gig by gig, until even the blur gets blurry. The lifestyle becomes addicting, and then the addiction creeps up behind you, puts its arms around you in a warm, tight embrace, and, be, and it becomes a one very long night on a nationwide and then worldwide tour. But regardless of the value, scale, or goal of the campaign, all the players deserve recognition and honor. And not just because they were there, because for some time, long or short, they influence or inspired someone. The early deaths like Darby Crash, Dee Boone and Exine's sister Muriel made us deeper with sadness and hardened us against what we hoped could be a long career that included the occupational hazard of living a hard, fast, and loud life. Some of us, like Country Dick Montana, Jeffrey Lee Pierce, and Top Jimmy, chose lifestyle over life and checked out after many battles, a few victories, and too many losses. But what the rest of us couldn't have anticipated was the long haul. What happens after the first blush fades? You don't measure up to either someone else's or your own standards. The money goes up, sometimes way up, and then stagnates or comes down, maybe way down. But our contribution grew from our collective effort through songwriting, gigs, words, touring, images through photos, movies, posters, art, performance art, radio play, and dedication to search for a different way to say something that might already have been said. Early on, we knew that some of us like Jeffrey Lee, Texacala Jones from Tex and the Horseheads, Dee Detroit from UXA, or Top Jimmy would struggle. Maybe they'd make it, but probably not. Tex and Dee are thankfully still with us. We accepted the adage that sometimes the wages of sin are death. But some of us were and are still determined to fight the good fight 
and maybe somewhere down the line we'd be recognized as doers who stood for something. Here is where the roots rockers and hardcore stand together. Though the music may have been far apart, the desire to author, offer an alternative to the blandness unifies us and gave respect to the music that started the whole punk rock thing in Los Angeles five years prior. Finding origins can be tricky. Everyone wants to point to their contemporaries as ground zero. Thousands and thousands of music lovers may not know Lone Justice, Rank and File, or Green on Red, but it's likely they have heard of Nico Case, the Abbott Brothers, and Wilco. They may not have listened to the Gun Club or House of Freaks, but they sure as shit know the White Stripes. Or if not for the big boys from Texas and Fishbone, who knows if funk would have found such a heavy core in the Red Hot Chili Peppers or No Doubt mix. Your basic punk rocker may not have Flipper or Circle Jerks on their playlist, but they can probably name half a dozen Green Day or Rancid songs. I'm not saying that those who came later than these pioneers I've mentioned did anything sneaky or underhanded. They simply got inspired and move the needle forward with their version of a musical continuum, which is twisted music for people who feel a little more twisted than your casual consumer. <laughs> what Nico, Jack White, Billy Joe, and Jeff Tweedy have in common is they all got inspired by some kind of music that included the scene called cowpunk, Paisley Underground, or Hardcore. Then maybe they went back even further to the originators and then turned it into Americana, of country, punk funk, country, or truly financially successful punk rock. The soldiers from the 80s worked hard, played hard, toured hard, drank hard, partied hard, and sometimes sat around and did nothing but dream and drink and fuck off. But they tried, and they did something. Some like Tomato to Plenty and Biscuit Turner enjoyed successful second acts, as fine artists and received the attention that their bands, the Screamers and Big Boys, truly deserved. Others who are still with us, like Mike Ness, Jane Wheedlin, Dave Alvin, Penelope Houston, and Maria McKee, moved forward with solo careers, while some others concurrently hold down straight jobs. Regardless of whether they stuck around, checked out, stuck with it, or changed directions, they all deserve honor and congratulations for taking that emotional, creative and physical risk. They all deserve credit for, for where they went and how. Credit for all the crappy cold dressing rooms or hot bubbly audiences 10 times bigger than expected. Credit for the hundreds and thousands of miles, day and night, riding in vans, saying stupid or brilliant shit to people you've known forever or have just met. Credit for getting paid less and still sending money home or being stupid and just blowing it on cowboy boots that don't even fit right. <laughs> Credit for setting up and tearing down the stage, which is a bitch, I will say. I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. <clears throat> uh, setting up and tearing down the stage and standing by the gear so it doesn't get stolen, which I still do. Um, credit for carrying on when all your shit does get stolen and strangers from another band or a music store lend instruments so the songs get played that night. Credit for all the shitty border crossings where everything you have with you is pulled out and scattered across the parking lot and you're strip searched in cold exam rooms. Fun times. <laughs> Credit for still paying attention and writing down a phrase that becomes a chorus. For sliding across and spinning around 360 degrees through two or three lanes of traffic on ice and snow. Credit for fighting off the blackness. When a bitter reviewer says your last performance or record was inspired, and this one wasn't. Or when the insipid A&R guy says, can't you just write more songs like Wild Thing? <laughs> Credit for the band who never really leaves their hometown but breathes fire for two or three years. Credit for simply putting up with all the transcendent moments and complete bullshit that invariably happen in rapid succession. Nowadays, when the news arrives that another comrade has cro crossed over, I greet it with a tight grimace and a light shake of my head and go on with my day. But the shadow lingers. 
That small sadness makes a little pocket inside. With all the other brave soldiers who went down before. And I'm grateful for all of, for all of those, for those of us who are still here to sing another old or new song, still here to tell an old or new story, and to continue to be brave for those coming up behind us. So. Yeah. That was really nice, John. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay. Yes. It's funny because I'm, I'm kind of, it leads right into your chapter. Okay. Is, you know, you're, well, it is. I mean, the, and, and that's, I got to say, uh, you know, I, I can ask myself the same question, of what, like what was surprising about these um, books and these chapters is that, is that they all kind of, fold into each other. They're, they're, you're, especially in the first book, and, and this one to a degree, you're hearing the same story from three different perspectives, you know, just because everyone has their own thing. But carry on. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm stoked to be here. Uh, real quick, I'll tell you, when, they, when I first got a little message from Tom, he said, hey, do you want to write another thing? And, um, and I was stoked. Like, I was stoked to be on the first one. And and John didn't mention the, the last Grammy Carol Burnett took for some reason. I, I, I thought she was dead. I, I didn't even know she was still. I'm thinking, oh, they give these things out posthumously. I'm, I was so shocked. But I don't watch TV, man. I don't know what's going on in the world. Uh, anyways, Her so, show's been canceled. <laughs> it's been off the air for a little while. <laughs> you think by now she would have slipped up and said something shitty about somebody else, but I guess I guess she has not. And uh, anyway, so so I asked Tom, I go to Tom, I go, well, what do you want? And he goes, well, I can tell you what we want, but you're probably not going to do it anyway. So why don't you just do whatever you want, and that'll be fine. And because uh, mine's nowhere near 82, 87, 90, 90, whatever. Mine happened to be that week, and um, and I was thinking about ego. Mine's about ego. And, uh, and what happens when you get everything you want and then you no longer have that anymore? Uh, there was a, a point in punk rock or whatever that basically I did whatever I wanted to do and it didn't seem like there was any reprisal in any way. And then that all started falling away and you start getting, oh, I'll read it to you. And, uh, and I got a tattoo on my face, which is John and Tom's fault that I have it. Uh, <laughs> I had been shooting my mouth off to my kid. I said, oh, if I ever write that story down, I'll, I'll get the, the tattoo on my eye to mark it. And, uh, and my kid's like, no, you won't. I go, yeah, I will. So then she finds out I wrote it. And she goes, oh, you did it, huh? She goes, come on, let's go. And uh, so my 18-year-old took me to the tattoo parlor and put a tattoo on my eye. But uh, it's not like I'm getting a real job anytime soon. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, it's like that's the least they're going to worry when they run my background. But... <laughs> Anyway, so it was really like I started thinking about these actresses, especially when they got older and, and not being able to get a part and what was happening and how it felt and, you know, what was going on. So uh, my story is called The Ongoing Cost of a Low-Grade Immortality. Uh, the first cool cut I ever caught was a crescent moon slash below my right eye. I was eight or nine years old and I'd been hit with a rock in a dirt club fight. The delinquent volley had been tossed without regard to the conventions of acceptable childhood warfare. I was momentarily blinded, stunned, but then light blue stars exploded like meth-addled embers in a pagan fire. I was a light. I stood in silent pride on a child's dirt stage, the blood running down my cheek, the tears refusing in shame to appear while that badge of dark red honor dripped like summer heaven onto my shirt. I remember my fellow combatants standing like dirty-faced varmints in the oncoming lights of a car. They couldn't or wouldn't move until my reaction to the wound had been established. My reaction. I knew at once that that cut was cool. It was tough. It was a kind of cut that made kids in the schoolyard realize that you didn't go down easy, that you weren't gonna take any of their little monkey bar bullshit. I smiled <laughs> as that small crowd admired me. I could sense the envy clutched in their all-never-be-anything hands. 
I bent down and picked up a rock, lovingly caressed its sharp corners, and then I casually said, let's go. In the space of a black eye, I had an audience and a vibe in the beginning of a wonderful reputation. I didn't want that cut or that rep to ever go away. Toward the end of the healing process, I'd pick the scab to reopen the wound. I'm older now and I reside in the body of a middle-aged man. The chest that I once marked with a broken heart tattoo, my pin skin protest to a romantically cruel world, well, it still displays my unending crisis with love. But now that flesh billboard of my failed romantic encounters hangs on a sagging pair of man tits. <laughs> it's hideous. And that cut, that beautiful crescent moon slash, well, I've spent my whole life trying to keep that blood flowing and that adoration coming. You see, you fuckers sit around wishing you could be somebody, a rock and roll contender with a big rep and a marquee cool, but you don't know what it takes to swing in this game, to become even a low grade immortal the kind of immortal who's recognized at the gas station or the supermarket on a Wednesday afternoon. My band barely had a name, but fuck man, even a little bit of noise will cost you. And the thing is, when I say cost, you squares think I'm talking about hard work, about putting in your dues, excessive practicing, and long, uncomfortable road trips smelling the stink of some fucker you hated before you even left town. No, that ain't the cost. That's the pleasure. That's the expectation of stardom and fame. The feeling that you've got an agenda and you're going to change the world with your stickers and your t-shirts and you're melting in the heat of a Midwestern Sun vinyl. That's the hustle you put in to get somewhere, but that ain't the price you pay for arriving. Rock and roll fame is like a credit card with an interest rate that climbs past prime, your prime. However, the bill doesn't come to until the lights go out until the last drunken groupie has wandered away from the dressing room, until nobody gives a fuck that your eye is cut, and no matter how many times you pick the wound, or leap from the stage, or drunkenly stagger up to the mic to do your best Chris Christopherson impersonation of a used up old rock and roller, they no longer stare at you with admiration in their eyes. They've wandered off to another younger model hero who is willing to bleed and to dance and to sing and to pick his wound for their love. Now you pay. I remember an evening when I stood and watched a young man perform, a boy barely 21 with jet black hair and a junkied out Elvis face. I was standing backstage, an honored guest hanging in the wings, and throughout the night many semi-familiar strangers had cowered up and paid their respects to me. I was floating on a stage of past glories and until then still future promise. Even the boy himself had come by and given me my propers. As I watched him saddle up to the mic, I saw the low, translucent buzz of the crowd lifting over the barricades and onto the stage, wrapping its way up his legs until the buzz was clenched like impassioned stardust in his hands. All eyes were on him, and not one, not even the backstage selfie-snapping clowns had their eyes on me. I was overlooked, passed by, shadowed. I was becoming the old limp dick in a three-way, the husband who thought it would be cool to have a young stud come over and bang his wife. Can I say that? <laughs> <laughs> and, hey, it's Long Beach, man. Anyway, all right. <laughs> Until he realizes as the romp progresses that his wife's eye is no longer his, and it's only a matter of time before he loses her, and he can't get it up. Ever so often you hear one of these so-called enlightened rock and roll C-words say he's only in it for the music. What a load of shit. If that were true, he never would have turned you on to his download. He never would have walked on stage or went on tour or released anything meant for ears other than his. He would have got himself a job, a little nine to five, here until I die, roll at servitude. And at night or on the weekends, he'd sit around in his shit-stained underwear and thrill himself with his rock and roll licks and his Bobby Dylan lyric writing expertise. <laughs> If you ever hear a song or see a band or buy a record, know that there's only one reason you're receiving it. It's because those fuckers want you to look at and to love and to admire them. They want more than laying down those tracks can provide. They need more. They just won't admit it. My old buddy, the drummer Hunt Sales, once told me that success was playing on a Saturday night. And he was right. A weekend gig means they still care and you can still fill a room and the booze will still be bought and the money will still flow. A weekend gig means your shit still stinks of rebellion and teenage sex. A weekend gig means they still love you and your last check me out anic is still holding true. A weekend gig means the price of stardom hasn't yet come due. 
Fuck, man, I remember when the first installment of my rock and roll immortality came knocking on my door. It was as if that hard-hitting fucker sales had thrown a premonition in my direction. It was a Saturday night, and a big show had rolled into town, and my band hadn't been asked to be on the bill. Cha-ching. Whoever said better to have loved and lost wasn't no rocker. He wasn't no give me a taste of that, now give me another. The bitch who wrote that line probably never even had it good. Good young when it still worked, when you're still strong and you can take on the world. He probably never stood on stage or commanded a crowd or walked into a room where the off flash cannons its way to the cheap seats as you kick in the fucking door and your voice rings like great gothic bells thundering across a landscape of upturned faces. He probably never felt adoration and then had it trickle away like an enlarged prostate piss on the bathroom floor of a rented studio apartment. He didn't know what it was like to have been loved and to remember what it was to rule, and now you don't. Oh man, I wish you fuckers could feel how much it hurts to lose. When I was young, I'd supplanted God. What use was there of a deity when my body was lean and my mind, although misguided, was cocked and firing, and the words that spewed from my mouth were the words of a warrior? When I walked on stage, there were those who were willing to follow my most absurd whim because what I gave them in return more so than this new punk rock sound, was my soul in sacrifice. I gave them the honor of watching me bleed. The other day I was in the grocery store. I was standing in the organic produce aisle. A man walked up to me, he was fat and old and dressed like his mother had laid out his things. Hey bro, he said, you're Jack, yeah? I lit up like a bitch. Yeah, I said. What's up, dude? Oh, man, all right. I used to really dig your band. What happened? Do you still play? Do I still play, I said. I climbed onto the produce stand, the sweet potatoes, and the onions rolling and scattering onto the floor. I'd show him what I still had. I deserved his love. Yeah, man, he said. Get it, bro. I prowled like a caged supermarket tiger. The clean and bright sail on aisle 14 slogans spat from my mouth with black leather fury. Yeah, he cheered, get it, dude. I delivered hard, recalling each twist and turn, my hips gyrating, my hand fist pumping at the fluorescent ceiling bulbs. One of the checkers ran up screaming, you can't stage dive here. <laughs> Fuck him, I needed this. I leapt from the counter and all 250 some odd pounds of used to be somebody hit the sparkling linoleum floor like a spilled container of past the expiration date pudding. The fat man cheered and then he pushed his cart on down the aisle. The show was over. I lay there, spent, useless on the ground, still.